there will be some key things that are listed that you need to do. You'll need to meet with your your uh, your chair and put together like a one page or less document that says this is my plan for addressing those bullet points, and then you'll send that in. Okay, but you'll still need to confirm that you received the email. Okay. All right. Rick, I'm going to let you introduce your team. Okay. So here you go. So, and I'm going to introduce a series of presentations that we're going to be doing this semester. Charles asked if I would help coordinate uh, a series of three different seminars. Some of you know some of the work that we've been doing in the library related to interdisciplinary innovation. It's part of a larger initiative that we're going to that we're, we're talking about in terms of how to improve innovation here at BYU. So today we're going to be talking about some of that bigger effort and then why this all matters. And then we're going to talk about some of the things that we're doing in the library, one of the, some of the, one of the initiatives that we're doing in the library. And then next we're going to have, I think it's Jeff Wright is going to come. He's one of the alumni from our department. And he helps with Taylor and other people. They teach a innovation boot camp in the College of Engineering. And so he's going to actually lead you in an innovation boot camp for an hour. Basically, a little experience where you can experience design thinking, which is what we're trying to teach in these experiences that we're having in the library. So he's going to lead you in a one-hour kind of rough, kind of quickie uh, thing of, uh, of the Innovation Bootcamp. And then we're going to have Holt Zog, who is an alumni of EIME, actually a former alumni of our department too, um, from a while back, and Jeff Belliston from the library. And they're going to come and talk about how design thinking might affect the library of the future, what libraries might be in the future. So we're going to be talking about a little bit today about the course that you know that the courses that you know that we're having in the library. And they're going to talk a little bit more broadly about libraries in general, what the future of libraries might be in the 21st century, and that kind of thing. So that's kind of the direction we're going today. Our today and then in the next three three series. And, and because of scheduling, they're not three weeks in a row. So you're going to have to kind of just know that these three are connected even though they'll kind of be spread out over the next month or so. All right. So I'm going to start off talking a little bit about why I think it's so important that we focus on teaching uh, creativity at places like BYU, or just in general. So some of you know about the Torrance Test for Creative Thinking, and many of you probably don't. Um, Torrance was the, the, what they call him the father of modern creativity. He was one of the leading researchers for about 40 years, and he developed the test that is widely known as probably the best test of creative thinking. It's called the Torrance Test. And one of the things that's nice about the Torrance Test is it doesn't look at creativity as just one factor. It looks at several different things that contribute to a person's creativity. This test is used now to measure basically giftedness. Um, they'll combine you know, test scores, like regular test scores and grades, within this creativity test to help identify kids for gifted programs in different states and stuff like that. And it has really good reliability. There's, a, there's an interesting study that they've been doing now for 40 years. They call them the Torrance Kids where they gave the test to several thousand of these kids and then followed them for 40 years to see how well the test actually predicted later creative achievement. And they found it to actually predict really well the kind of creative achievements they, they had later in life. So it's a, it's a pretty well respected test. And you don't need to know necessarily too much about this except that these are four different things on the test that they're looking for. Four different aspects of creativity that they're looking at on the test. Now the other thing you need to know about a little bit is the Flynn effect. Who here knows anything about what the Flynn effect is? Yeah. That each generation's IQ is raising. IQ scores go up about a standard, I think it's a standard deviation each generation about. So we're getting, you could say smarter, but that depends on what you think about the IQ test, but we're getting better at the IQ test every generation, right? So, and that's been documented for a long time by a guy named Flynn. So Dr. Kim, who is, uh, does a lot with Torrance tests, she wondered if there was a similar effect with creativity. Maybe we're getting more creative each generation, just like we're getting, you could say, more smarter each generation. So she went and looked at the Torrance scores. And you can see that for most of these, the scores were going up until about 1990. And since 1990, we're going down in pretty much all aspects of creativity. These are K through 12 kids, mostly. That's, that's interesting. <laughs> then you start to draw correlations with maybe policies that came around about the same time, emphasizing different kinds of pedagogies. And we don't know exactly what all the reasons are. Obviously, it's a correlation. But you can start to ask questions about why is it that creativity scores are going down now. And you can read more about this. There's an interesting article, a summary in New York Times called The Creativity Crisis. And then you can read her paper in 
Creativity Research Review. Now the problem with this, unfortunately, is that this is really bad timing, that creativity is going down now, because people are calling this the creative economy that we're in right now, where no longer is it as important to just have knowledge, like it used to be, because knowledge is free on the internet, now it's more important what you can create with knowledge, how you can create new knowledge, and new ideas, and new applications. And uh, they're calling creativity a key requisite skill for the 21st century and an essential competence and the critical prerequisite for people in careers nowadays. So it's kind of unfortunate that people are, that we're doing worse at helping kids to be creative and this is the time when they need it the most. An ultimate economic resource. So, another study here, this was done with a thousand different Americans, uh, various different jobs um, uh, in America here. And 78% said creativity is important to their current career. These are all different kinds of careers. Not just arts careers, not just design careers, all kinds of careers. And 71% said, you know, I wish creativity was taught as a course at the university, and I use it so much, it really should have been part of the curriculum, is what they're saying. So the academy responds, um, by academy, higher education. So higher education said, well, we better do something about this. And so a lot of universities are starting to try to attack this issue of how can we help our students to gain the skills of creativity and design that they need. So one of the big ones, of course, is the D School that you can see there in the middle, um, out at Stanford. And um, they're kind of the light that everyone's looking to is a really good example of interdisciplinary innovation. They got multiple different colleges working together and an emphasis on teaching students how to apply design thinking to their various disciplines and projects. But they're not the only ones. So we've got all these other ones all over the place, and it's kind of interesting for us here at BYU to see what maybe some other people um, that would be important to us are doing. The University of Utah, for example, they are having a, they're doing a system where you actually go and live for a semester or two and live with the people that you are designing and working with and creating stuff with. It's a, it's a residential experience, and it's interdisciplinary, and it's, it's really cool what they're putting together, the Lausanne Institute. Is that only for single students, then? No. You can just for you can just for the semester. It's an internship. <laughs> <laughs> but here's something really interesting, too. Look at this. A new cluster, design, thinking, and innovation, basically like a little minor. Do you know which school that is? BYU-Idaho. BYU-Idaho. So BYU-Idaho has a minor, more or less, in design thinking and innovation. And what do we have here at BYU? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have my class, free, shameless plug, I have a class free term you can take. Um, that's what we have. No, we, have, we do have more available, but the problem is, and we're going to get into this, is that what we have here at BYU is not co-located and coordinated very well. It's spread out in lots of different colleges, lots of different instructors, and spread out throughout the whole university. And we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later in terms of what we're trying to do to coordinate those efforts a little bit better. But first, I'm going to turn the time over to Taylor to kind of lead us in some thinking about what, what can we do about this problem that we have here at BYU. It's good to be with you guys. I think uh, Charles let me come here because I went to Indiana University with him. We followed him here. So, we're going to do a little uh, design thinking exercise. I want you guys to break up into groups, three to five. And here's the question. You have two minutes to figure this out. How can BYU become more innovative, okay? And create a list. I actually see almost nobody has any analog devices, so do it electronically. That's fine, too. Okay? Ready? Go. <laughs> Right, right, but... 
Okay. Uh, 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 uh,
guys act out or verbalize how this new innovation is going to roll out across your life. Okay? Three minutes. Maybe we should take the form of creative space and delivery. So you can have a role as a Yeah. 
creativity needs restraints as well. Okay. So that you can channel your thinking. Were there any restraints that we placed in this last 10 minutes? Chocolate. Okay, well, chocolate was one. How about the fact that we had 10 minutes? Frankly, it's pretty ridiculous to say, hey, 10 minutes, we're going to figure out how to make people more innovative. But I actually want each team to send your ideas to Rick West's email. Because I'm confident there's some interesting ideas there, particularly the chocolate. That yeah. We can implement in a month. Yeah, more chocolate on campus. <laughs> We're just going to raise time. All right, so, but please send your ideas to Rick because there might be kernels of something interesting here that could influence the change in direction of what happens to BYU. Yeah. Having a time limit reduced our inhibitions to say crazy stuff. So we're more willing to say something that came to our mind. Okay, good. We didn't have time to... We didn't have time to work it out. Yeah. And yeah. Right. right. Okay. So there's lots of ways of being creative and innovative. You guys have experienced many of them. We just want you to experience it again. That thinking, brainstorming, that's the main category up here. You then diverge your ideas. That's the idea of sharing lists. Obviously, there's a technical snafu there. Um, and then converging your ideas, honing on a particular problem or solution, and then acting it out, concretizing it, and then if you add twists or other constraints, it can provide new insights, new ideas, new solutions that perhaps may not have been known to exist otherwise. Yeah, and I love I love the idea of the twist that, that Taylor gave you because we're going to talk now about what we're trying to do to increase interdisciplinary innovation. And the reason for being interdisciplinary is exactly for this reason. It's when you sit down and you say, I have a solution as an instructional psychology technology person, but when I talk to a humanities person about the same problem, they have a different way of thinking about the problem, and it's a twist that I have to adjust for and compensate for. And usually when you twist in that way, you come up with better ideas because you're adding in um, strengths from this other discipline that, that then increases your, your solution. So that's why we want to increase the idea, not just of creativity within your own courses, but creativity in an interdisciplinary way across campus, because we think that's when you can really get the most benefit. So I'm going to tell you about a couple solutions that we're trying to put together, just to make you aware of them. One is the Creativity, Innovation, and Design group. This is a faculty group, but we do several things for students to try to help students. Um, if you go to innovation.byu.edu, this is the website for it. You can also follow us on Twitter at BYU Innovation. And we basically put up articles about innovative stuff happening on campus, people that are doing innovative stuff, competitions that are coming down for innovation, new classes being offered, things like that. We'll write articles. Um, uh, Greg Williams and Rob Nyland have both helped us with this in terms of putting together some video case studies. Um, and we've got a, a student right now helping us that's a, an English major who's helping to write some of the stories, for the content for that. And then we tweet things out on the on the, um, the Twitter. We also have a calendar on there, and this calendar actually feeds into the BYU.edu home calendar. So you know, there's like academics, athletics, and you know, arts. Taylor was able to get innovation put on there as one of them. So there is an innovation calendar at BYU, and, and basically we're trying to cult, we're trying to bring together all the calendars of all the different groups on campus. So people that are running some kind of design studio in some college over in some building, we're trying to get all these people to send us their events so we can have one event calendar of all the innovation-related events on campus. That's one thing we're trying to do. The other thing we have on this website is a list of all the classes on campus related to creativity and innovation. Um, I'm going to give the credit to Taylor for this again. He went through, we got recommendations from faculty, but then he actually went through the list of all the classes and pulled out every class that mentioned creativity, innovation, or design. And we put together on this list, it mentions whether you have to be a major, because some are closed to, to non-majors, but some are open to non-majors. So you can take these classes. Uh, we, it mentions whether there's prerequisites, it mentions what colleges is, it mentions what kind of things they're focusing on. If they're focusing on like entrepreneurship, or versus they're focusing on design, or you know things like that, or theory. So um, you can search for different classes that you can um, take um, here at BYU. And then we also have a page where we list all the student clubs on campus. Like there's a game design club, interface design club, the Innovation Academy, Entrepreneurship Club. There's all these different clubs out there that you can join and participate in as well. So what we want this to be is kind of the main website to bring together all the different efforts that are happening on campus and give it a unified place where you can go to one place and get all the information on classes, research, teaching, projects, and things like that. So just be aware of that. It might be interesting to know about and also just to tell other people about. And there's links there for students and for faculty getting involved. 
and um, other things like that. The other thing we're trying to do is, what we're, is what's happening in the library. Some of you know about this because maybe you took a class with Dr. Gibbons in the library this last semester. But we were talking with several other groups. There were several groups on campus that had the same vision for, for BYU, saying we need a place where we can do interdisciplinary innovation. And the problem with interdisciplinary is if we do interdisciplinary innovation here in the McKay School, then everybody's going to think that it's education stuff. If we do interdisciplinary innovation in the, in the business school, everyone's going to think it's business stuff. Even though you might tell them it's not, they're going to think that, and then you're going to have questions of like, we're over here talking about ownership, who owns it, who controls the budget, who does all these different kinds of things. So we said, well, we need something that's academic Switzerland, something that's neutral. It doesn't belong to anybody. And everybody can come there and be equally at home there and, and, and feel like you have as much say in that space as any other district does. And so at the same time, the library was exploring, what do we do with our library in the 21st century? People still read books, but maybe not as much as they used to. Um, do we need all the space that we dedicate to books, or should we do something else to support teaching and learning at BYU? And that's their main goal, support teaching and learning and the student experience. And so they came to us and said, what if we gave you some space in the library? Could that be part of this puzzle? And then we said, that sounds great. So there's a group of us trying to organize some of these courses. And in general, the courses are supposed to be interdisciplinary. They're supposed to be open to people from different majors. And they're supposed to be design-focused. They can't be just, oh, I'm going to go into the library and then lecture. So I'm going to go in there, I'm going to design. And we're going to do design stuff. And then also we're going to go in there and work with the library. The library wants to be more than just the people who recommend books to you. They want to be the people that support your learning. And they have some pretty interesting backgrounds, a lot of them. So I taught a class this last semester that was developing instructional artifacts for the dust game that maybe you've heard about, which is a science game to teach middle grade science. Uh, it's an alternative reality game. And we had um, one librarian working with us who had a background as a software engineer for NASA and has a PhD in, in astronomy and stuff like that in science. I had another one who used to work for public health and also has a PhD in science and came and taught us neuroscience stuff. Um, I have another one who is a um, K, former K-12 teacher and now has a PhD. So there is a, these librarians have really powerful backgrounds, and they were able to come in and basically consult with the students and help them on their projects in a really powerful way. It's kind of cool. So we want to talk a little bit about these courses. I'm going to share a little bit of information, and then Melissa has been helping us doing the evaluation work on this, and she's going to share some of the evaluation data that we've had um, as we've done this for about a year and a half now? Two years. Two years. No, sorry. No, a year. A year. A year, yeah. A lot's happened in a year. So in one year, we've had 15 different courses come through this space. Five different extracurricular activities, like boot camps, Innovation Academy holds their meetings there now, and things like that. We've had 230 different students come in through this space. And it's been interesting. Some of them come in because they already knew about the class. Some of them find out about it in very interesting ways. We were interviewing one group of students. And, and they said, yeah, you know, one time we came in to work on our project and someone had written on the whiteboard, I don't know who you are, but please call me, I want to do this too. Here's my number. <laughs> it, was some, it was some girl that had come in and she had seen that, because people, if you, if you go up to the fourth floor of the library, you'll see this instructional space and there's things on the wall. There's, they put whiteboard paint on the wall, so there, there's things written on the wall and there's pictures of, what, of their prototypes all over the place. And she said, what is this? I want to do this too. And so she said, please call me. And so they called her and she got the call. <coughs> so people getting involved in kind of interesting ways. But 230 different um, students, 18 different faculty participating from all over campus. And <coughs> I, do we know how many different disciplines? I, I don't know if that slide's up here. I don't know. How many uh, I think it's 15 disciplines or something. Yeah. 15 different disciplines have been co-teaching in this space, which has been kind of cool. So I want to show just a little bit of a clip that actually Rob and Greg both, both kind of worked on a little bit. And um, we're not going to watch the whole thing, but just a little bit so that those of you who haven't been in the space can see what's happening. And then I want you to think about this. How is this kind of learning and teaching different from maybe the way we typically do learning and teaching? And then let's, let's talk about that for just a second. Okay. That's not going to work. Will this work differently, Rob, if I just pull it up on YouTube? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You can pull it wow. out in another computer. Uh, it, should, it should work now. Should it? Yeah. 
I would say allow it. project with BYU and the University of Maryland, and we're designing a game that will be used to get middle schoolers interested in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And it's a new genre of game, so it's an alternate reality game, which means that it plays out across different media channels, and there's a story that unfolds as the player community, it's a whole group of people that play at once try to solve puzzles or contribute content that advances the story. So we actually propose two different ARGs. One is going to be a, a more open-ended alternate reality game where the students themselves can help dictate and drive where the story goes. And the other will be a more narrative close-ended ARG where we're, we're kind of leading people along a path and giving them a, an outline of where we'd like them to go. And we're going to test both of those to find out which one is best suited to help teach these STEM subjects and can kind of move the needle in America of uh, young people getting engaged with science again. Uh, this is a really fun class because Derek Hansen in the School of Technology and I have been talking about how can we collaborate with our students from all these different disciplines. We have, for example, students from music that are doing sound and, and music for some of the apps that we're designing. We've got technology students from IT and computer science. We have artists, including graphic designers and illustrators, working on assets that will be used in these different um, art, or different apps and, and websites. We have um, a linguist who's helping us with our chat bot, which we're writing this kind of interactive artificial intelligence you can talk with. So really a, just a huge range of different um, expertise, and, and that's kind of required for a project like this that plays out across different media channels. So you get a whole different perspective with a lot of different um, points of view, but by bringing them all together in this collaborative space, we have a chance to innovate new solutions. So I wish we could watch more, but um, better not. So let's go back here. So let's go with just two, maybe two, two comments. What do you think? What did you see here that might make this a really uh, make this a different kind of learning experience and a a useful learning experience. Yeah. It's a real and very complex project. And so having to go through the whole process from blank canvas design to something that's usable is really valuable to learn that process and how to talk to the people in disciplines. Yeah. One more maybe? Yeah. Students learn how to work with people outside their discipline. Like they will in the real world. Melissa maybe can talk to that, but there are people that say, do you want to say, why don't you get up? And okay. Melissa's been doing this evaluation for us and been doing a great job, and so she'll talk a little bit about what she's been finding in the research. Yeah, with the interdisciplinary collaboration, that's one of the biggest things they say, and it's always funny because it's like the engineering students and the art students. And the engineering students are always like, the art people, they just talk in circles all the time, and they don't really make a point. And then the art students are like, the engineering students don't really listen to us. But eventually they say that they learn to match styles and they find out in the end they came up with something great. They just went about it in a different way. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, so this is our evaluation of the space. We've just been doing online surveys and interviews and observations and all that fun stuff with it. Um, so like, like you guys were saying now, the changing pedagogy, we're project-centered <coughs> class. 
So we don't have an instructor up giving lectures. The students are working on a real authentic project, which makes it messy. So it's not nice and neat like you give to students on tests and stuff. They have to actually work through um, a lot of different elements of things at once. Um, and then working on interdisciplinary teams. Another thing students like, and some of them like this and some of them don't, and they have mixed feelings about it, is that it's not structured like a regular class. So they don't really know what their grade is in a lot of these classes. And some of them are like, oh, it's great. I don't care about my grade. And some of them are like, I need my GPA to be OK. And so uh, they're, they're learning to do this. Some of them say, oh, it's a really good experience to learn how to set my own goals, set what I need to do to get the project done, and my own deadlines. Um, because in the real world, I'm not going to be given an assignment with due dates for everything. So most of them come to appreciate that, but it's kind of this interesting mixed feeling about how they are. And then uh, the faculty serve more as like mentors and consultants. They kind of help them along, help guide them in the project. Mostly. So yeah, one student recently, you're not given all this information, you're having an experience. And then another student is so useful, so ahead as far as education goes. You're going to be ahead and you're going to understand a lot more things than if you had just stuck your head in your bubble. So we talk about bubbles a lot. The students talk about a lot. So as part of this, we have our surveys that we give on Qualtrics Online to students. Um, and these are just highlighting the type of pedagogy. Um, students really felt they chose their role in the team and the type of work they were doing. So that's that flexible, self-determined environment. They can make choices about their designs, and they view the instructors and mentoring. And then the other interesting thing about this is since the grading isn't the same as other classes, the motivation has to be different because there has to be a reason they're working. And so it's just a whole lot more authentic because they're trying to create a product. And a lot of the time, most of these projects too are service oriented or outreach oriented. And so they get motivated to do it for something beyond just a simple grade. And what you're trying to do is give a good product instead of just a good assignment. So it's a different feel, different incentive. And here's survey results on that, having a deep personal motivation to do well beyond the grade and feeling responsible. And there's there's a few mixed things about responsible. Some of the classes, some of the students said that they didn't feel students felt responsible enough, but on a whole, they felt that naturally they really engaged in their product in their project and felt responsible for it. Um, and then we've looked really carefully at what students learn in this environment. Um, one of the interesting things that I didn't expect when I first started looking at it is they really learned a lot more about their own discipline in these classes. Because you have this person who's maybe a music person, and they're used to being surrounded by music people who know what they're talking about and who can help them with things, and having professors in their field to guide everything. And now they're the only music person in this group, and they've got to figure it out themselves. So and that's partly where the library comes in too, because they have to find the information they need to produce these products in their field. So some of them go back and talk to their teachers in their field, and then they bring the ideas back. But they really have to learn how to apply their skills um, independently. And then, of course, they're interacting with all these other disciplines, and they learn a lot about that. And working on a team and project management leadership skills. And then we talked a little bit about communication skills. Um, especially interdisciplinary, working with students from other disciplines. And that's good because in the future, a lot of these students, that's going to be their job. More and more commonly, they're going to work with people from other fields in the future. So this is one student. All of a sudden, I'm working with these programmers and people from science and people from writing. And they're really great because of all the ideas they bring to the table. They are things that I never would have thought of. That would be brilliant. It makes you think of the world in a different way and makes you see the world in a different way. And we've heard a lot of comments like that. Um, and just learn, they learn a lot of stuff unrelated to their expertise they have. Any questions about this? All those things? Be straightforward. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit, and I think in a few weeks we'll hear a little bit more about the library. But what we found so far about holding the course in the library, the students really like it. Um, sometimes there's complaints about having to leave their major building and walk over there, but on the whole, yeah, they have to get exercise. As a whole, they really do like it, because especially, I think a lot of these projects have been taking place in the Laycock Center in the past, and some of them still are over there. 
But a lot of the like engineering students and stuff would go over to the Laycock Center and the HVAC, and they would just not feel on equal footing with everyone. They didn't really feel comfortable. So they really like having this place where they all come and they all feel comfortable working together. They started to use the librarians a lot more. Um, some has been instructors have led them into doing that. They just found the librarians can help them a lot, find information they need. Um, and then a lot of students say they are using the library a lot more since they've done it. They've gotten more comfortable going to the resources the library has, and they're using it in other ways outside of the course. And then faculty also, because a lot of faculty are involved in courses that are outside the regular expertise area. So they also have to find information and specialty topics about things outside of their realm. So they also really appreciate the library and their help in providing that information. Um, so these are, right now, some of the challenges we're having, um, trying to grow the diversity of courses and instructors. That's been better this semester. We've had a lot more variety, but that's a little bit tricky sometimes. And then what colleges are in charge of what courses and what credit faculty get for teaching in these courses. Um, and then another thing we're looking at is we really want it to be a space where students can like come and work at other times outside of their class and where they can leave their stuff out so they don't have to pack things away and worry about things getting erased or stolen or things like that. So we want to expand the space so that it's something that they can come in and work on outside of class as well. Um, right now with the way the library is set up temporarily, we're not there yet, but hopefully it's coming that way. And then, and I think Arthur talked about this, letting more students know about the courses is the big one. What are projects chosen for these courses? Um, I think we send out, we would know more about this. Right now they're pretty much just instructor um, determined. So the instructor says, I have a project and I have a collab another faculty member who's going to work with me on it and we're going to advertise it. And that's kind of the issue right now. But we'd love to explore other ways of doing this in the future where maybe students could recommend a project and say, but I need this and maybe courses and faculty can then kind of sign up to be willing to mentor certain kinds of projects. I don't know, but for right now they've been, basically like faculty would select it for their own courses, that's what's happening. Faculty select a project and then choose this what we're going to work on for our course. So, yeah. Do you think that just having students involved in interdisciplinary projects helps people with their innovative skills or is there some like explicit instruction or guidance or something that's required to really help them grow in their, yeah. their skills? The courses all kind of approach that differently because we have different professors teaching them. Some of them explicitly teach some innovation skills, Taylor class usually do. Um, some of them are really just focused on the project and they don't go much beyond that, but the students are having the experience in creating something and so I think it's still influences, but we don't have much data on that. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Yeah. Do you have a deep philosophical question? Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh, can you teach creativity? Or are you just eliciting latent creativity that's already there? No, no. Yeah. Or just trying to draw it out? Or are you actually doing things to explicitly teach creativity? Yeah. Creativity is a skill that you can help people both unlock for what is latent as well as develop and expand into new areas. focusing on students, like what are students learning, what is their experience like, how is it different from other programs at BYU. This semester we're moving into looking a little bit more at faculty and looking at faculty experience and the librarians that are involved and trying to see how that affects their work and how it, if it bleeds over into other things they teach. Um, the research questions are driven by the libraries interested in this space, they're experimenting and so we're trying to gather data that what they're hoping to accomplish is happening. That this is actually creating learning opportunities that may not be as 
easily available elsewhere on campus for faculty or students. So that's what's driving the research questions. Let's thank these three. <laughs> Downstairs for soup kitchen. So that we can have to take it. You're welcome to come down and take it.